Hey guys, the Comics Kid 2099 here, and I am one half of the Podcast Boys. I am joined by my co-host, Connor Nielsen. Connor, how are you doing today? I am doing very well. How are you doing today? I'm also doing very well, and uh, we are going to be talking about uh, Season 2, Episode 15 of Twin Peaks. Uh, this episode is called, uh, what was it called? I remember thinking it was a weird title. It's uh, called Slaves and Masters. Yes, uh, that is the title. And Connor, what happens in this episode, Slaves and Masters? So there's quite a bit going on. Uh, the plot is thickening on the whereabouts of Wyndham Earl and Cooper's hunt to find him. He's still deputized by the Twin Peaks Police Department and Sheriff Truman. And we have Albert Rosenfield back. Thank goodness, I thought we he would no longer be in this series, but he is back to help with the investigation. And we also find out about the abouts of what happened with Leo and Wyndham Earl. They are still in this crazy shack in the middle of the woods, but Wyndham Earl is prepping Leo for something, and he has a shock collar around, and he's acting all wild and crazy. And Wyndham Earl, a weird kooky disguise, and gets into the Great Northern and has a message for Cooper at the end of the episode. Also happening in this episode, we have the South winning the uh, war. We finally have the Ben Horn uh, crazy going nuts having Dr. Jacoby and Jerry and Audrey and Bobby and 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 (laughs) everyone else getting sucked up into this. Uh, We finally have resolution to Ben Horn finally comes to after Lee wins the Civil War for the South and Confederacy. Then we also have the wrap-up of, I I assume the wrap-up, I certainly hope it's the wrap-up, of the Cougar Lady subplot and James. What happens is uh, James and Donna are trying to just wrap things up. The the police are looking for James, and uh, they're trying to expose the setup that Cougar Lady and not John Cazell had had everything set up for. Uh, They're trying to disprove that. Anything else happen? Oh, yeah, um, what happens is uh, Mr. Eckert is back in town. They have dinner with uh, Piper Laurie's uh, Catherine Martell, and uh, they have discussion about what to do with Josie. And it's also implied that Josie is Cooper's shooter because Al Rosenfield is back in town. He is, you know, he investigated the body of uh, Mr. Lee because remember last episode, Mr. Lee died. Uh, They found three slugs in his skull and he thinks that it's going to be a match with bullets that were found in Cooper's body when he was shot at the end of one. And Shelly gets her job back at the double R. Ed and Norma get together for some cuddling and uh, Nadine says she's okay with it. Oh, and she also got second place in the gymnastics thing. So, yeah, I think that's everything that happens in this episode. So, Comic Kid, what did you think of this episode? Uh, um, I'm, I'm wavering between it was okay and really, really hating it. Uh, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of anything I actually really did like, and I think there was a few things, uh, I guess one thing, uh, you'll probably be really happy about, even though Josie is in this episode, she doesn't really do a whole lot, uh, that was good, because I saw that she was going to be in it, and I was like, oh boy, but she, I don't remember her talking very much, uh, so that was a pleasant surprise. Uh, like you, I was happy to see the Benjamin Horn subplot finally wrapping up. Uh, this was just stupid. Like, that's the only way I can describe it. I don't know why we needed, like, 55 episodes of Benjamin Horn going crazy. And like you said, it sucks all these other characters into the subplot. And Audrey and Bobby, at least, are so much more interesting in other subplots. Although Bobby hasn't really done a whole lot this season. Uh, him going to work for Ben Horn is a good change for him. But since Ben Horn has been psychotic this entire, uh, well, at least since he got out of jail, then this change of character doesn't really do anything for Bobby. Um, so I'm glad to see all that wrapped up. I could have done without the really hokey send-off to uh, the Wizard of Oz where he says, uh, I had a dream and you were in it and you were in it. Like, that was really stupid. And then, like, Bobby <laughs> starts playing the bugle and everyone's laughing and like, oh, Ben. It's like a, a sitcom episode. Um, that, I was that, kind of cheering, too, because I really don't like the subplot and I'm happy that it's over. Oh, I'm glad it's over, but, you know, (laughs) did we... Like, I'm more just saying, like, did we really need it? And I don't think we did. I'm also glad to see, seemingly, the Cougar Lady subplot with uh, Cougar Lake Bell. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, over with. Uh, Here's the thing. Lake Bell does not make any sense, okay? So, in the previous episode, she tells James to run away because apparently she actually fell for him during this whole plot to frame him for the murder of her husband. But then in this episode, she's acting like she's a cold, callous ice queen and that she doesn't care for him at all. And basically, it's just that this lady is inconsistent and this series is inconsistent on how they want to handle her. Uh, She tells James to run away, but then in this episode... Uh, the police are talking to her and uh, Diet John Cazell, and uh, they say, like, okay, what was his name? And Diet John Cazell says, uh, it was Jim something. 
And then she's the one who pipes in and says, his name was James Hurley, and he's from Twin Peaks. So if she actually fell for James, then this is really stupid that she's the one telling the police all this information about him. Because they could have very easily, she could have just let him get away and said, I don't remember his name. Now, sure, she's probably scared that Diet John Gazelle is going to try and kill her or something if she doesn't go along with it. But it's weird that she seems like she regrets it, but then she's the one who's giving all this information about him to the police. And then Donna, oh boy, Donna comes in. <laughs> <laughs> so Donna's talking to Diet Lake Bell, and Donna says, you need to leave him alone because he's a good person. And, like, basically, she says, uh, Diet Lake Bell says, I'm not going to leave him alone. We're bad guys. We don't care if he's a good person. Like, that's basically what it is. And so she's acting like, like she doesn't care about James at all there. But then James comes to her later, and he's acting really stupid and, like, kind of pushing her around. But then he's kind of kissing on her, and then uh, Diet John Cazale knocks him out, and then, like, uh, Cougar Lake Bell, I guess, has another change of heart, and she shoots Diet John Cazale. I don't know if we're going to get any more with this or not. I don't remember. Uh, I think I blocked most of this subplot out of my mind because it's stupid, and this character <laughs> is so inconsistent, and I don't know why we needed this subplot other than just to give James something to do, I guess. But uh, did you like this? Uh, anything about this subplot at all? Is there anything I'm missing that am I being too harsh? Oh, I kind of like this episode. <laughs> That's interesting. Cause, uh, 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 you're I'll... you're over here ripping this episode a new butthole, and I'm so <laughs> like, I kind of like it. Uh, no, um, I get why you dislike it. Uh, I do want to talk about this, and maybe this will be like last episode where I started off saying I liked it, but by the end of it, you convinced me that I was wrong. So like, no, uh... this subplot is beyond terrible. But I should probably mention that I, I didn't mention who uh, the creative people were behind this. This episode was directed by Diane Keaton. Yes, that Diane Keaton, K from The Godfather. And it was written by Harley Payton and Robert Engels, who have been longtime producers on this episode, uh, on the series. Um, I think yeah. they're probably the ones that took over after Lynch and Frost were kind of given the boot. Oh, both Lynch and Frost. I, I knew that we had um, mentioned before that uh, Lynch had kind of been pushed out. I didn't know that both him and Frost had kind of been... Uh, pushed out i have not seen any of like, i have not seen a mark frost credit in a long time probably the one that tied up everything with uh uh leland probably was the last time i can think of yeah that that's the one i think of as well Pretty and i because because like the only time that i ever see his credit is when it's under executive producers with him and lynch but yeah. that's always been there because they created the show yeah it's, so that's yeah. obligatory but when i was watching this episode i was telling you about this before we started recording uh I saw Diane Keaton was the director, and I thought, well, that's got to be a different Diane Keaton. It can't be the Diane Keaton that everyone knows about. And then, like, simultaneously, you and I, right before we were recording, you, you said something, and I was like, oh, it's the Diane Keaton thing, right? Because I had just looked it up, and I was like, that's the Diane Keaton. Uh, that's funny. Uh, I had no idea. And what, so you said she was in The Godfather? The uh, K from The Godfather. Oh, okay. um, I know. Oh, yeah. You haven't seen The Godfather, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I know her from some other movies. I, I know I've seen her in something before, and I can't think of what I've seen her in. Yeah, I mean, she's Diane Keaton. Every she's she's a movie star. She's classic Hollywood. Everyone knows who she is. Yeah. Um, she's she's um Michael Corleone's wife in the Godfather movies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, like she's she's the woman from the Godfather movies, and she's awesome. The thing with movies, I think she directs this episode very well, very stylishly directed. I like a lot of the camera choices. I like a lot of the uh the way the camera moves around, especially the, there's a scene between Ed and Norma in a bed, and the camera's like swinging between the two. Yeah. I, uh, like that. I really. I really like that, and it doesn't do that for the entire scene. It just does that for about half the scene, and then it just cuts to a different angle. It, it never felt monotonous. So yeah. uh, it was just a really cool stylistic choice. I really liked how the angle, how I really like how she used the frame, especially there's a scene where Shelly and Norma are talking, you know, close to the floor at the double R, and then uh, Harry enters the frame uh, at a higher uh, over the counter. Yeah. And so she's really using the frame in a very smart, intelligent way. And I really liked it because it was also consistent with what we've gotten from the show as well. Especially like after the uh, like the, the opening titles, there is another there's like a second credit sequence. That's just a really creepy slow mo chessboard sequence. That was yeah. also very well directed. So I like that a lot, too. That was what I was going to mention was there was a couple of moments where it's panning over something in slow motion and it's like really close up. Uh, I really like that was when you said that you liked the direction of this episode. That was what came to my mind immediately. I, I like that quite a bit. One other thing I liked about this is I'm really liking the mystery about Wyndham Earl. Um, I'm really uh, it's very intriguing. I'm liking this. And I think uh, more than anything, at least in recent memory, Twin Peaks is uh, feeling like a lived in connected town. And I really, I really got a sense of that in this episode, uh, especially with the chess master. Like we have Harry Cooper, Doctor Hayward. And they're all playing, and then like some other guy, and they're uh, playing, Toad. they're playing chess with. Oh, it's Toad. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I completely forget about Toad. I'm sorry, Toad. 
Um, they're having a chess match with Jack Nance. And then in that very same scene, it's a different scene, but it takes place in the same setting. Harry gets over and walks over to talk to Norma and Shelley, who are having their own little thing. So just in the double R, just in those two scenes, it, this whole town really kind of comes to life and it feels so much more connected than I feel like it has in a while. That's interesting that you say that because uh, this episode has two outsiders like coming in and moving and you know moving their weight around. Like you have Wyndham Earl, who's not a local, and you've got Thomas Eckhart, who is not a local, and they're both starting to influence the plot quite a bit. They're going to be more important to the plot as we get on. But you're right, this does feel like a very connected, like everyone in town knows each other uh, kind of episode. And so it's interesting that that happens in an episode with two outsiders who are not part of the town. Yeah, and so it, it, and. I like that because it makes the two outsiders stick out that much more. Yeah. It makes them feel like they are moving in on this connected society. And it, and as much as I despise the James and Donna subplot, which has reached stupefying new lows, <laughs> it does make it feel more isolated. And I think that's good uh, because the subplot should feel isolated, not because I hate it. I do hate it, but it should feel isolated because it's happening outside of Twin Peaks. Yeah. I should go ahead and mention, you said you like the Wyndham Earl stuff. It's not really working for me. Uh, I feel like he is just a really crazy, maniacal supervillain, but I just don't feel anything from him. Uh, this, uh, The previous episode, I was kind of down on it, and I was having trouble putting my finger on it, and basically, I just feel like the series is kind of inconsistent on what they want him to be. Uh, was he always crazy, and he was just hiding it from Cooper, or was Cooper's uh, sleeping around with Wyndham Earl's wife, did that throw him over the edge? Because it kind of wants us to think both. Uh, like, uh, originally, Cooper was saying that his betrayal kind of threw him over the edge, but then he says that Wyndham Earl committed a crime, and he, the wife saw the crime and witnessed it, and that's why she was in protective custody. So, like, the series, I don't think it can really decide on if it wants Wyndham Earl to be someone who has always kind of been a little nuts, and then uh, he just kind of, he got found out by Cooper and everyone uh, later, or if they wanted him to be someone who was once upon a time a nice guy and then he fell to the dark side. Like, I wish it could just be, I, I really wish it was that he was a nice guy who fell to the dark side, but I'm a little confused on his plot. He's got, you know, a paper that has Donna, Shelley, and Audrey on it. And it's like, oh, I'm one of them, it's going to be one of them. And then Leo is, uh, I really like Leo in this episode. Like, I never thought that this series would be able to make us feel sorry for a serial spousal abuser, uh, but it does it. Uh, and this is a guy who, I mean, he's involved in drug trade, uh, he's killed people, uh, he constantly uh, is terrible to Shelley, but then this episode makes me feel sorry for him when Wyndham Earl is, like, beating him with a uh, flute. I like that. Uh, I think that's interesting that it's able to make me feel that about Leo. And then, like, he's, uh, Wyndham Earl is saying, one of them is going to be my special girl, and Leo's starting to say no. And, like, you know, you're feeling like, oh, Leo is kind of worried about one of them, probably Shelley, maybe. I don't know. But, like, I'm still not really feeling anything on the Wyndham Earl stuff. Uh, it's just not grabbing me right now. And that's a shame because you look at the second half of the series after the Laura Palmer stuff is all wrapped up, and the Wyndham Earl subplot is like the big thing. And it's just not working for me this time around. I can understand that. What I like is we have a couple of... Well, I, I guess I should say I'm really liking this on the Cooper side of things and the stuff that's happening at the uh, Twin Peaks uh, Police Department. Yeah. I should also say I think it's weird that we don't have any Dick Tremaine slash Andy slash Lucy subplot, and we also don't have any Hawk in this episode which is a sin um, <laughs> that I will get on this episode for. And we also don't have any of the uh, subplot involving... Um, I'm missing... There's one more subplot that doesn't get any light in this episode. Uh, well, uh, Hank is mentioned, but we never see Hank in this episode. We don't get to see Denise. I guess Denise is gone. Yeah, now. she was only in three episodes. I, okay. I saw David Duchovny's IMDb, and it said he was only in three episodes. And I saw that after he had already left the show, and I was like, oh, we're not going to get any more of him? That's sad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like we should have at least had a send-off for Denise. I feel like, you're right, it seems like we are missing another subplot, but I can't think of what it is right off the top of my head. Because uh, we get the Benjamin Horn stuff, we get a little bit of stuff with Norma and uh, Ed and Nadine. Uh, it seems like there's something missing other than the Lucy and uh, Andy and uh, Dick Tremaine, but I can't think of what it is. And I had it just as we go, so I'm really uh, I'm in my brain for that. I guess uh, the thing is, I like the stuff at the police department, because... We, I feel like he, uh, we're doing kind of that classic pulps thing that we don't really see a whole lot where they're juggling multiple cases at the same time. Yeah. And that's always fascinated me. I don't really like the movie Inherent Vice very much, but I like the conceit of there's a private eye detective and he has like three that have nothing to do with one another and he's just trying to solve all of them at the same time. 
yeah. and it's in the 1970s, and so everyone's just like stoned out of their mind the whole time, <laughs> and so the whole movie's very delirious. But I like that kind of classic thing because I mean I like it when it's revealed that everything's kind of connected, but I also like it when it kind of breaks that formula and it's just people trying to you know just this is their job is to solve these cases. They're not always going to be all connected. So we have the stuff with Wyndham Earl that's taking up most of the time. But then we're also like, hey, there's this thing with Josie. we got to investigate her. Hey, you were also shot. Oh, dear, there's this Mr. Lee guy. He was shot. We have to investigate him. And I think that might answer some uh, cold case about you getting shot from Earl. Yeah, but, you know, earlier in the series. So I'm liking how they're handling that on the police front. And I guess that's making me like the Wyndham Earl stuff more. And okay. I think I really like the idea of, because the whole time I'm watching Wyndham Earl do his thing, I'm trying to connect it to what the clues they've discovered at the police station. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. And well, so I find it somewhat engaging. And then we also have the stuff with, like, the chess match. Like, I really like that. That brings the town to life. Because if anyone's going to be a chess master and it's not going to be Hawk, then it has to be Pete. So I, I like that a lot, too. Yeah. Like, I, I, dude, when the, 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 and so because he's an older guy, he likes fishing. Of course he would like chess. That sounds completely in character. So uh, and the big reveal was awesome. For a second, I could have sworn it was going to be Hawk. And I was actually just going to pump my fist in the air and just search you know just yeah this is awesome yeah you go hawk but of course it wasn't him if it wasn't going to be hawk i'm glad it was pete and it adds to his character i like that and you know we were saying several episodes ago that it's a shame that pete didn't get more to do in this series and i i can't remember when exactly it was <laughs> that i brought this up but i was saying that pete should have been like the oracle to the bookhouse boys he should have been like at home base like handing out missions like hey hawk you're needed on the other side of town uh there's a bookhouse boys thing going on over there or something like that and that's this is like the closest that this series gets to that uh and so i'm glad to see pete being used beyond hey i brought home josie's laundry yeah i, I just the jo the josie's laundry thing like i guess this is the best way to tie up the plot of who shot cooper which honestly that happened 15 episodes ago it's out of mind by now like i had forgotten all about that and I feel like this is a little late to be trying to tie that up. You should have tr probably tried to have tied that up a little earlier, I think. But uh, how contrived is it that on a pile of, like, 4,000 items of clothing that Cooper just happens to grab a strand off of the coat that was worn by Josie whenever she shot him? Like, yeah. how, many, how many clothes is, is he carrying? Because Pete comes in, and it's enough clothes that it's, like, really heavy, like, heavier than a human being, I guess. And then he hands it off to Cooper, and then Cooper sets it down, and he grabs with some tweezers a strand off of a coat. Like, that's just really contrived. Uh, and I guess that's the best way to try and bring this subplot back, but it's still contrived. It is. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it is contrived. But I was distracted by how well-directed that scene was. Um, I like oh, how that... Was. The way that opens is we have Cooper getting a cup of joe, and he opens up the percolator and smells them like, oh, is there going to be a fish in the percolator? But there wasn't. <laughs> but uh, while he's doing that, there's Pete comes in through the entryway, which has a little bit of a window into where Cooper is inside that little op inside that entrance hall. Uh, so it was just a really neat way to use the frame and show a character entering uh, the building while not necessarily being in the same room. It was just a really cool way to use your real estate, use your frame, use everything. I really liked it. I, I, I was impressed by that. I agree with you. That's another good uh, thing that was in the direction and less good in the actual writing. Uh, but uh, I, I want to go ahead and say this. <laughs> Since we mentioned last episode where you really enjoyed it, but then I talked about how much I hated it and it brought you down a little bit. I should point out I don't want to do that. Uh, anytime I hate an episode, if you enjoy it, I don't want to be the guy who says you're wrong and this is why it sucks. But like – Right now, I should say there are some things about this episode that I liked. I liked Albert Rosenfield coming back. Uh, I love when he sees Harry, they hug, and they're like, Oh, my goodness, Harry? I love it. That was so fantastic. Um, I, I love how far Albert has come. Like, when he's coming in as Bobby and Shelly are leaving, and then he just yells, Get alive, punk! And yeah! Like, I, I love that line so much. I don't think that Bobby and Al have had any interactions at all in this series, so that was really great. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, Al is only in the episode for, like, five minutes. And then he tells Cooper that wearing the flannel really works for him. I thought that was great. I like the scenes with Albert. I like the scenes with Pete. I like Catherine, even though uh, I'm still not entirely sure what she's up to. I'm assuming, since Thomas Eckhart tried to kill her brother, that she's playing Eckhart right now. And she's going to be doing something against him. But right now, she's pretending like she's friendly with him. So uh, I like the stuff with Catherine, even though I'm not really sure what is going on with her. Uh, I didn't like the stuff with Donna and James and the cougar lady and I'm glad that the Ben Horn stuff is all wrapped up but like I did like some stuff about this episode I don't want it to seem like 
you know how you hated the the first like 10 or 15 minutes of season two like the the opening of season two like i didn't i don't feel as strongly about this episode as you did about that you know what i'm saying oh i know what you mean and i'm not saying like uh it's I, th- I mean, what, I guess what I'm more saying is, uh, you're really showing off the uh, the chinks in the armor that I wasn't really that I was kind of giving a pass to, and I was like, oh god, I guess you're right. It is more of a bigger deal than I thought it was, and I find it actually more amusing you just kind of going off on this episode than I feel it like disheartening. So I don't feel <laughs> disheartened at all. Oh, I think it's good. actually kind of funny because me and you have we talk to each other in a very um, I don't want to say civilized manner, but we have a rapport and respect for one another. So that way we talk, we're we're very respectful towards one another. But when you just talk on this episode and it just gets under your skin, it's just really funny. Just like hearing you go off on this because you're usually not like that. It's pretty funny. Well, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that amuses you. I- uh, and also, I should say, it goes both ways, because you're talking about some of these shots that are really interesting to you, and I'm more of a story guy. I don't pay attention as much to the way the camera is angled and stuff like that, but when you're mentioning stuff like that, I'm thinking back, and I'm like, yeah, that was really cool. Like, that shot about Ed and Norma, uh, when they were both in bed together, like, I never would have mentioned it, but you brought it up, and I thought, yeah, that was a pretty cool shot. So it's also, in some ways, making me enjoy the episode more, which is great. Yeah, and I was really noticing the direction of this episode, not just because it said Diane Keaton, and that makes me want to... Because I've done that for a bunch of directors I've never heard of in this series, so uh, (laughs) it's not just a thing. Uh, But I also just got finished filming a short film over the weekend, and I mean, I wasn't the director, I was an actor in it, but it's my, my brother was directing it. And so because I live with a guy directing a short film that I'm in, I do see a lot of the creative process from his point of view. And also you're... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, what were you saying? Uh, well, you're more of a film guy than I am. I will watch a movie if the story looks interesting, if it looks like it's in a genre that I'm interested in, but you will watch most movies that come out, whereas I will, if it's something that the story doesn't look interesting to me, or the actors, or the director, or people that I don't really care for, then I'm not I'm not as much into the film world and like all the technical stuff about films that you're into. Uh, we come from very different worlds in that way. Yeah, that's true, and I think that helps us complement one another. But when I was making that short film, we spent a lot of time setting up shots and really yeah. making sure we got the best lighting and making sure that the focus was just right on every single shot. And like, in the, me as an actor, I'd be waiting around for like sometimes 30 minutes just waiting for them to get their shot right. Yeah. And so I, I guess now, like right now, I just have a lot of focus on the craftsmanship of uh, directing just like anything, like TV, film, whatever. And I mean, I talked, you know, I just watched Star Trek Beyond, and I was... Uh, thinking about the the way they made that and certain shot compositions while I was watching that more than I was say a week ago. So maybe and then maybe that just is just because of what's ha- what I've been uh, doing for the last week or so. But it did make me enjoy the episode a little bit more than maybe I would have had I not done that earlier this week. Right. But so, I mean, yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, wait, wait, sorry. What do you want to talk about now? Um. Well, there was one more thing that I wanted to complain about, and then that's all of my complaints. Uh, so the rest of it can be a positive episode. So you remember how last week I complained, and it was a nitpick, but uh, you see Dr. Jacoby in the Great Northern with Ben and Audrey, and then we see him at the police station, and he says that he's been with the Black Widow for 24 hours, but he was just yes. at the Great Northern. We have a similar continuity snafu here, and... I have a theory about a way that it could have been a fix, but I'm not sure. It's not explicitly stated in the episode. But uh, Donna, is she's come to this little town that James was staying in, and then she and James are at the bar where James got recruited to fix this car. And then she's on the payphone trying to get in touch with Ed because she says, Ed can help us. Uh, Right now we just need to get you out of this jam. So she calls Ed, and then this police guy comes up, and he's just like kind of staring at her while she's talking uh, to, and she doesn't want to say, hey, James has been framed for murder while there's a cop standing next to her. So then she starts saying, like, yeah, Annette, you were telling me about your boyfriend. And she's, like, you know, doing that thing where you pretend like you're talking to somebody that you're not talking to. And she's really bad at it, I should say. Like, uh, I am very surprised that that cop actually uh, bought it. But uh, anyway, so you would think that she was talking to Ed since she called him. But then the next time we see Ed, he's in bed with Norma. And he's talking to Norma about how they're going to build their life together, and he doesn't seem worried that his nephew has been framed for murder. Uh, So the only thing I can think of to make this make any sense at all, other than say it just doesn't make sense, is that she called his answering machine, and she was hoping that he would pick up. But that's the only thing that makes any sense to me, because otherwise, Ed got a call from Donna saying that James is in trouble, and he said, sorry, I'm about to get lucky, I'm going to have to get back in touch with you tomorrow. (laughs) Like, that's the only thing I can think of. But but James is in danger. Ah, who cares? He's probably thinking, finally, that no good kid, <laughs> I, I'm not going to have to deal with him anymore. Another thing about Donna was I think that I could have been made to have liked her 
confronting uh, the cougar lady, uh, she just does it in such a whiny teenage way. Like, I like that she's being proactive. I like that even though I don't understand why she's trying to save James, uh, I like that she is trying to do something, and she's more proactive about it than James is. James is just kind of like, no, don't call Ed, and then she's like, I'm going to go call Ed. Um, I like that she's actually trying to do something, but my problem was, and I mentioned this line earlier, she just says, leave James alone, he's a good person, and it's just like, are you kidding me with that? Like, I'm not a supervillain, but that would make me laugh. Like, I would just laugh in her face if she said that to me, and like, I think it would have been really cool if, you know, she's been doing this thing for a while now where she's trying to act like she's tough as nails, uh, she's trying to pull off a, a femme fatale look and attitude. Uh, it would have been really neat if she just went up to the cougar lady and, like, pointed an empty gun at her and said, leave James alone or I will shoot you right now. Like, something like that. That would have gotten my attention. I would have been like, wow, when did Donna become awesome? And then you know, <laughs> she, she could tell James later, like, oh, by the way, there's no bullets in this gun. Something like that. Like, that would have been really cool, just the way she goes about it. And then later in the episode, she's crying, and I'm just like, Donna, shut up. You're, you're annoying. You're always annoying, but, like, why are you the way that you are? Um... Yeah, that's all the complaints I have. I want to mention one thing before getting back to the Cougar Lady subplot. Um, uh-huh. yeah. You know what? No, why don't I just talk about the Cougar Lady subplot now? Because I, I hate it so much. Okay, oh. this is really going to bring the beast out. Um, the, uh, I've been pretty soft on this episode, but I, I hate this subplot. I thought we were done with it last episode. I did but too, it's yeah. Still, it's still here. And well, it's so bad. Okay, so there were two moments where I laughed out loud. There's the part where she says, he's a good person. I audibly laughed. <laughs> it was hilarious. Do you want to guess what the second thing I laughed at was? Yes, because I had a moment that I laughed at, and I think it was genuinely funny, when uh, she said he's a good person, and Cougar Lake Bell says he was good at two things, fixing the car and me. I thought that was really funny. Um, and then Donna, like, she's probably not happy to hear that her ex is over here drilling cougar ladies in another town. <laughs> But, like, you know, I, I don't know if Donna, what her intentions are. Is she wanting to get back together with him, or is she just as a friend trying to save his life? Like, I, I guess that would be good to know, uh, because, again, like, she, they left on not great terms, or he left her on not great terms. But I'm still kind of surprised that she's even trying to save him. But uh, that was, to me, I'm surprised that we didn't have Donna, like, huh, I'm just going to go off and pout because my ex-boyfriend has found another woman. Like, that's something I would have expected from her. Uh, so, but I did laugh at that line. Was that what you laughed at? No, that was a funny line, but like unintentional laughter, I should oh, say. Oh, okay, okay. No, I don't. It's, what was the other? Thing? It's where James goes, "You taste pretty good too." <laughs> <laughs> you know what it reminded me of? Who? It reminded me of in Men in Black Two, where none other than the actress who plays Donna, Lara Flynn Boyle is plays Serlina in Men in Black 2 and she turns it like so the Serlina alien turns into Lara Flynn Boyle in lingerie oh, and then yeah. this this random thug just walks up to her like the second she just walks out and he goes hey pretty lady and then he licks her and he says you taste good <laughs> oh wow it was I, <laughs> I haven't seen uh, Men in Black 2 since I was in high school and I think I fell asleep when I was watching it so I did I did not know that that was her in that movie uh, but yeah I uh, I picked a bad time right when you you quoted James. I was taking a drink of water and I almost spit it <laughs> spit it all over my computer. That was a uh, very I don't like James. I don't know is he trying to be like the tough guy because when he comes in and she's like she's like putting her hands around him trying to like uh, you know seduce him and he like pushes her down on the couch and then she gives her spiel saying like I just. What did she say? She said something like I love the taste of you and he, then he says you taste pretty good too and that's right when that's right when the uh, Diet John Cassell uh, knocks him out, and uh, good thing he did because if we had gotten much more dialogue like that, uh, I would I would have split a rib or something. <laughs> it was so silly. Um, <laughs> so, you know who Cougar Lady reminds me of? Because I have not seen a lot of Lake Bell. Uh, okay. So, you know who she reminds me of? Who? Uh, and it just clicked. Kim Bassinger. Uh, Bassinger. Yeah, Bassin yeah, she's got a little bit of, uh, especially like I. I'm going to go ahead and show my hand as mostly just a comic book guy. Uh, the only passenger that I know is the 1989 Batman film. But, yeah, yeah, I, can, yeah. I can see a little bit of that. Mo mostly in the hair, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's probably the thing that gave it away to me. Probably her bone structure probably looks more like Lake Bell, but... Yeah, I can see Bassinger. That wouldn't have occurred to me unless you mentioned it, but yeah, I can see that. Kim Bassinger was also just in The Nice Guys, which is an awesome movie. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've seen, I haven't seen it. I've seen the trailers. I, the trailers look good. 
But anyways, I, I, I don't get this subplot like at all because the characters just are flippy floppy so much. It's really just uh, Lake Bell. She's the worst one. Like every other character, I understand. Like James is an idiot, and he gets hooked into this whole thing. And you know, we said several episodes ago, uh, if a woman shows interest in you. You know, that that is not good. Like, this is a woman you don't know, and, like, you just sit down at the bar, and she's already like, hi there. Like, you need to be a little wary. Like, I'm not saying that all women are untrustworthy, but in this situation, I think, James, you should have put up your guard a little bit. Like, James is an idiot. I understand him. Diet John Cazale, I understand him. Lake Bell is the only one in the subplot that does not make any sense, and she ruins the whole thing, other than the fact that James is in the subplot. Yeah, the thing I don't like, though, is it feels like these people know they're in a in a soap opera. That's the problem I have, because we have, like, she sleeps with James, and then when she leaves, she's like, oh, hello, Diet John Cazale, and they start making out. <laughs> and then the next episode, or two episodes later, now it's like, He's all smarmy, and I'm getting, like, a totally rapey vibe from him. He's like, oh, come here. <laughs> and she's like, okay, don't, don't touch me. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's so bizarre. Whatever happened to, Mwahaha, our plan is coming to fruition. Now let's make out, grab my leg while we're making out. Like, that, that's not in here. Why is that not in here? Their, their plan is coming to life. Yeah. And did she really fall for James? Like, how could anyone fall for someone that stupid, let alone two people, let alone three people? <laughs> so, I... Oh. I just don't get this yeah, i don't get know, i don't I, I don't get why they're like hey he came on over to fix the jaguar um so where donna and james are, all right people are gonna look for us where do we hide out i know how about the bar i found her in we both found her in this exact same bar how about we hide out there like that's the stupidest thing they could have possibly done yeah uh you know the thing is if she did fall for james which i guess she did and you know we were confused about that last episode but the problem is it's not earned She's only known James for about four episodes, so that's about four days. That is not enough time for you to fall in love with the mechanic who's fixing your husband's car. I, I'm sorry. Like, I, I'm, you know, one of these people, I'm very much a skeptic about true love and it was love at first sight and all that. There is no way that you fell in love with somebody after four days. Like, and, and you, you change your evil plan of trying to frame that person for murder after knowing them for just four days. It doesn't work that way. Like, if this had been going on for, like, a season, I could have bought it. Uh, but it's too soon for her to have already, like, fallen for him, I think. Yeah, so there's also, like, this weird directorial choice. I like it because it's sort of experimental, but I don't get how it fits into the story. Uh -huh. It's constantly, like, fading or superimposing her in a car while she's wearing, like, funeral garb. Like, a black dress with uh, black stockings and, like, a black veil over her face. So is that, like, her on her way to the funeral for Diet John Cazelle? Uh... Is I don't know. Uh, there's also this other weird thing where they're in the bar and then Donna's talking about James like he's been taken or he's missing or something. Yeah. And then the next time we see him, he's just popping up like at the cougar lady's house. Like, OK, was there so something I missed? Something happened off screen that we don't know about? Like, I, I need to know these things for this thing to make any sort of cohesive sense. Yeah, um, I'm I'm like you. Uh, I'm really glad the subplot is over. And the worst part is this takes up so much time, but the second they get back to Twin Peaks, none of this is going to matter. Well, and that's kind of the same as the Ben Horn going insane thing. Like, uh, the only thing I can see coming from that is that maybe Audrey is going to have more of a role in running the Great Northern now that she is single-handedly uh, responsible for bringing her father out of this uh, psychosis. Like, Jerry in a very weird turn of events, like, he's straight up telling Audrey that it would be a good thing for her father to stay in this state of mind that he's in. Like, even if you do believe that, and I, I could see Jerry thinking that, like, hey, this leaves room for me to take over, and now I can kind of be in charge. Like, I could see him being that enterprising and trying to pull that off, but don't tell your niece that. That's, like, one of the dumbest things that he's done, and he's never been a very bright character anyway. Like, uh, I thought that was, but, you know, I guess we're kind of transitioning from the Cougar Lady stuff into the Ben Horn stuff, but, like, in the same way, I think the Ben Horn stuff, now that it's over, I don't see it really mattering any. It's just been filler, but I do think maybe I'm optimistic that Audrey is now going to be more involved in running the company. Um, I guess so. The only thing I can even possibly imagine anyone getting out of the Ben Horn uh, Confederate subplot is how it's slightly amusing to see... Like, you know, someone might get some kind of slight amusement out of it. The only amu amusement I got out of it this particular episode is just those very brief moments of Bobby and Audrey kind of playing off one another where she slaps him in the face. Yeah. Like, and that was kind of amusing. He's And it's weird because, like, early in the episode, he tells the cops that he and Shelly have been together since before Laura died. But then in, in this scene, he's like, 
kind of trying to cop a feel on Audrey, and he's trying to kiss her at one point, and that's when she slaps him at one point. And then later, Bobby says, "I thought the North won," and she slaps him again. But like he's kind of he's kind of trying to flirt with her, and I'm. Like, again, you know, several episodes ago, we were talking about how we thought maybe, or you thought that uh, he and uh, Audrey were going to become a thing. And I remember that that didn't happen, but and I didn't want to say anything. But uh, it kind of feels like Bobby is trying to have his cake and eat it, too. Uh, and I guess if anyone in the show is going to do that, it would be Bobby, I guess. Yeah, no, I'm okay with it because he already cheated on Laura. <laughs> That's true. Um, and he, he's trying to get ahead in the world, and I mean, Audrey Horn looks like Audrey Horn, and it's like, hey, I, I kind of get it. It's kind of part of his character, and her not having any of it just kind of adds a bit of a comedic factor to it. That's a good point that I forgot that about, you know, I don't know why I forgot about it, but he was cheating on Lara, so it's in his character. And, and he is, like you said, he wants to work in the business world, so uh, yeah, I, I redact that complaint. It's a bit of a reversal on the typical, like, a uh, woman trying to get ahead in the business by sleeping with all of her higher-ups. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of, like, Bobby trying to do that, but just getting rejected. I like that. Yeah, I thought that was really funny. Um, so what do you think of the reveal that Josie was the one that shot Cooper? <sighs> Whatever. I mean, <laughs> I'd cool. Like to, I'd like to know why she did it. Uh, this is, like I said, this happened 15 oh, episodes I ago. Oh, I did it because, uh... We had an arrangement. Yeah, it did. <laughs> I don't know. Like, she... Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh. We had an arrangement. You were supposed to give me tea. Die. <laughs> <laughs> oh man like she barely talks in this episode and they don't have the confrontation with her yet so i imagine we're gonna get some more explanation when they finally do confront her but like i i don't i feel like it's way too late to be trying to tie this subplot up it's been so long since it happened i had completely forgotten about it and this show is already half soap opera half parody of a soap opera that honestly i think i would have preferred if this had just been a dangling subplot if the series ended and we said wait a minute we never found out who shot agent cooper like that would not have bothered me i don't think because it is a soap opera but trying to make it be her now that begs begs the question why did she do it and we don't know and i'm not sure if we're going to get a satisfying answer well it's josie so we're never going to get a satisfying anything but and, and did you notice you know how um back when she was spying on Catherine and ben horn and then uh <laughs> harry said uh, what were you doing at the hotel? And she said, I wasn't there. And then he said, Hawk saw you there. And she said, uh, I gotta go. Bye. <laughs> like, we get the same, the same thing happens here where she, Cooper, and Harry are in the room, and then, uh, Harry straight up tells her in as plain a way that he can, Mr. Lee is dead. He's been shot three times in the back of the head. Did you have anything to do with it? And then Cooper says, I'm gonna go get some coffee. And we don't see the resolution to that whole plot. We don't know if she said anything or if she just kissed him and said, let's have sex right here. Uh, we know that she answered the phone, uh, and it was Thomas Eckhart, and then the next time we see her, she's serving Catherine and Thomas Eckhart. Like, did she tell Harry anything about uh, Mr. Lee, or did she just kind of string him along like she's done in the past? I have no idea. And furthermore, have Cooper and Josie ever had even a, a scene together? Like, uh, just them. Just them. No, no. I don't think so. So that makes, like, there's no information that could have, like, foreshadowed her shooting him. It's just a complete, uh, well, there's Josie. I mean, what's I mean, she done? She, she's only... left town a couple of times. Yeah. The only thing the only thing I can think of is that she was maybe afraid that he was, since he's an investigator, that he would figure out that she was involved with the death of Catherine's brother, or seemingly the death of Catherine's brother. Uh, but... If you shoot an FBI agent, then you're just going to be making things worse for yourself because now people are going to be investigating who shot Cooper. Like, now they've got proof that you did it. If you didn't do that, then Cooper probably wouldn't have come after you. Uh, they might have eventually figured out that Josie planned the death, but, like, it seems like she was trying to cover her tracks but just making more of a mess doing so. Yeah, um, that's what she does best. But the thing is, <laughs> that happened when... That happened the night the sawmill burned down, and that was during the investigation of Laura Palmer. So, does the does Laura Palmer's life have anything to do with Eckhart? Was the sawmill like in any reason why she shot him? Like, there's there's a lot of questions that could potentially be answered, but I just don't think they'll be satisfying because nothing about Josie has ever been satisfying on a dramatic or narrative level. Other than that, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Because I think we've pretty much talked about the subplots that were important in this episode. Yeah, I want to talk about Albert, because I love Albert. Um, yeah, he's great. Uh, the last time we saw him and Harry, there was the part where he says, I love you. Yeah. And then they just like and he like just gives him a big old hug and then leaves. And then Cooper's like, he, uh, Albert's path is a 
twisty windy one or something to that effect. Yeah. Or and complicated or something like that. Yeah. And the, so the next time he shows up, they just like give this funky hug to each other, and I really <laughs> like. It was really cool because it felt like there's been some character progression between the two of them that ha- has happened off screen. But I'm okay with that happening off screen because it has a sense of camaraderie that's built over time. And I really yeah. like that. Um, I like his imitation of Gordon Cole. That was hilarious. Uh, but furthermore, um, I want to see like a comic book miniseries or like maybe just a one shot of um, Harry and Albert like going to a bar, and then like there's like they stop a crime together, and then they develop like that secret hug. IDW. Get IDW. Get now. Higher yeah. stat. I tell you what, just go ahead and do an ongoing series about the FBI agents in Twin Peaks, and then you can do one issue that's Albert and Harry uh, forming a bond. That would be great. I would yes. Buy, I would buy that. Um, I'm not going to lie. That would be really, really good. Um, I like, Dark Horse, uh, Boom, IDW, whichever one. Just please get on that. I don't IDW just struck me because they do a whole bunch of licensed stuff anyway. That'd be like the one I would want to see do it. But yeah, any of them. Yeah, they, they they do the uh, they do the Ghostbusters. I think they are they doing the Twilight Zone series that's being written by J. Michael Straczynski. I did not know that was a thing. Um, they did uh, Ghostbusters, like you said. They've they've done Transformers since like 2006. Uh, they've done Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the last uh, four years, I think. Uh, so they do a lot of like properties that are ongoing things. Uh, so if you would want to see more than just a miniseries, IDW, I think, is the place you'd want to see it. Yeah, but I also know Dark Horse has Alien, Predator, and a lot of other uh, That's true, uh, independent... Yeah. yeah. I, I will go ahead and say, you know, I was talking about things that I liked about this episode. I do like Wyndham Earl's cat and mouse game with Cooper. I like everything about that. What I don't like about Wyndham Earl is his origin story about how he became a psychotic supervillain, and also this new subplot with the three girls. I don't really know why he's targeting these girls other than just to get at Cooper. Uh, but it seems like there's other ways he could have gotten at Cooper. Uh, I do think it's a little bit funny. Uh, Cooper comes into his room and he sees this uh, mask on his bed. And I guess it's supposed to look like Caroline, but <laughs> it, just, it just looks like a normal mannequin head. It doesn't look like any person. Uh, but uh, it, it, it looks like the mask that Audrey used in One Eye Jacks. <laughs> it does, yeah. Uh, I didn't realize that, but yeah. Um, and there's like a recording there, and it's like Caroline was such a beautiful woman, wasn't she? And it's like that's what Caroline looked like. She she had a very plain face and like was made of ceramic. That's weird. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's a uh, that's all I had to say. Did you have anything else you wanted to add about this episode? Not off the top of my head. Um, oh, just very quickly. You know, okay, so the Dana Ashbrook, the fellow who plays Bobby Briggs. Yeah. Have you seen pictures of him recently? Uh, I did see a picture from just a year or two ago. He, he looks kind of different. He's, he's... He has white hair. Yeah. He looks just like Leland Palmer. It's crazy. Yeah, I think I had seen that. Uh, I, I think I, I know which picture you're talking about. Yeah. Is he, uh, is he in the revival? He is. He oh, is good. in the revival. What if that becomes like a plot point where like his hair turns white? Oh my goodness, oh, that'd you know, be crazy. What if he's a? What if he's actually Leland's illegitimate son? We'll we'll just completely soil that relationship between him and Laura even more. <laughs> and soil the bond he has with his own father, who's dead now. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um. Well, that was uh. That was all that I had to say. Uh, you didn't have any further things to add. Uh, okay, I got a question. Then the three okay. girls. The three girls on the paper. Yeah. Wait, it's Shelly, um, uh, it is Audrey, and who else? Who's the third one? Donna. Oh. Well, we know it's not going to be Donna, because who cares about Donna? I get why he has Shelly, because that's Leo's wife. Yeah. And then I get why we have Audrey, because uh, she's important to Cooper in some capacity. That's true. So, yeah. I just don't get why we have Donna. Like, it's weird. I think, I think it's just like... We need to do something with Donna. We don't have a subplot involving her uh, when she's not saving James. Like, what has she really done this season? So they need to do something with her. But from a character point of view, you're right. It doesn't make sense. Uh, so I guess they could just pass it off as, Wyndham Earl's crazy. He doesn't need a reason to do something like that. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Crazy is lazy. Um, <laughs> I will say the big set they built for the Confederate Treaty, uh, Dr. Jacoby dresses Ulysses S. Grant surrendering for the North. Yeah. Like I've not I've not liked the subplot. It's just been a big shaggy dog joke. Uh-huh. But I guess it's not because I mean I guess it did resolve in a way that was consistent with the rest of it. But it was it was kind of amusing just seeing uh, U- uh, Ulysses S. Grant portrayed by Doctor Jacoby, who's not good at memorizing lines. That was yeah that... humorous, I guess. Like and that's like the thing. This whole 
I mean, I like seeing Audrey put on a southern accent for a second. That was kind of amusing. <laughs> Bobby not knowing how to play a horn was kind of amusing. Jerry just stumbling around was kind of amusing. The way it wrapped up was overly silly and sitcom. Uh, I big shrug for me, I, but I like the set. I mean, the set was pretty cool looking. Yeah, and uh, you're right. I like Dr. Jacoby. Uh, like when he said, "I'm here to surrender." It's like. The Spanish-American War, sir. I said, do you remember me at the spanish <laughs> And it's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. It was a good war. And it's like, no, it was not. And then, like, the, the rebel flag drops down. And I'm like, was that an accident? Did they accidentally drop that down? Like, <laughs> that was all really funny. And uh, I, I will try my best not to do a uh, foghorn leghorn accent again. Uh, that was... Uh, yeah, I at that. Well, I mean, yours is not any better than Richard Bamer's. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, oh, and to be fair, Richard Bamer is not... a He's not a bad actor. I think he's deliberately doing a bad southern accent. I, oh, I, I, I know that. I know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, the that was funny, Jacoby trying to – and, like, it's Jacoby's idea, so you'd think he'd be a little more in it, in, into it, instead <laughs> of being like, oh, uh, I'm here to surrender. Let's go ahead and get it over with. Like, it's his idea to that he'll – and somehow, miraculously, it works. Like, we were talking about how this guy is just a big quack, but apparently this completely insane idea, somehow it worked. Uh, that that's you know what I'm happy I'm glad that it's I'm glad that it worked because otherwise it's over <laughs> yeah it, it's not like real medicine where it would take years to get him out of this psychotic episode uh, uh, when it comes to uh, his psychosis like I liked when he got out of prison and he was just watching the old footage of him and his brother like at the opening of the Great Northern yeah like, that was a great little moment and then he just went overboard with it and it was. <sighs> Yeah, I like that scene too. Where I think we both really like that. You, you like it, I like it. But um, yeah, after that, it's just it feels like this has been going on forever, and like I don't really see how I know where Ben Horn is going through the rest of this season. Uh, I was thinking about this earlier today, and I was thinking, and I, and I guess you'll find out in the next episode or two. But like his character arc, the next arc that he goes through is so much more interesting than him just being crazy in the hotel for like five episodes. But like. I guess they felt like they needed some, some filler again. Like, they just needed something to kind of kill some time a little bit. Yeah, and one last note. Catherine doesn't have a whole lot to do in this episode, but once again, Piper Laurie's awesome. She just owns the scene. I, uh, I like, you know, her little dinner scene that she has with that one dude. Yeah. Uh, so I, that was kind of cool to see. It's, it's just good to see Catherine doing anything. So Yeah, she even with the material is very non-existent or just not very good she still kills it doing what she does so uh, i really like that too yeah um, that's all i have to say all righty well then uh we are done with talking about this episode but we will be back in a week or two to talk about the next episode of twin peaks uh, i am the comics kid 2099 and i am connor nielsen and we will see you guys in the future have a great rest of the day <laughs>